Welcome to our live uh, presentation entitled Transplantation Risk and Benefits. Thank you for joining us. My name is Lee Clark, patient educator at the Aplastic Anemia and MDS International Foundation. I will be moderating the presentation today. As we get started, we recognize the generosity of Bristol Myers Squibb, Alexion, Novartis, Acceleron, Apellis, Takeda, Genentech, and Jazz Pharmaceuticals, along with our patients, families, and caregivers for supporting this conference today. Due to the high volume of teleconferences on the internet, it is possible you may lose your connection during the program. If you are unable to view the session online, you can call in to hear the audio portion of the program using the call-in number in your reminder email. Today's program will be archived to our website within two to three business days. You will be notified by email when it is live and ready for viewing. Immediately following the presentation, there will be a question and answer session. Please feel free to submit your questions at any time during the presentation. To submit a question or comment, open the Q&A window in the lower part of your screen, type your question or comment in the small text box window, and when you have finished typing your question, just hit enter. We will do our best to get to all of your questions today. When asking questions, I respectfully ask that you do two things to help us manage the incoming questions. First, submit your entire question all at the same time. Two, please do not share private health information in your question. Our speaker cannot answer any specific questions related to your health care. Today's presenter is Dr. Hemant Murthy, who is an oncology hematology physician with specialty in bone marrow transplant and CAR-T and, leukemia, and is in a leukemia practice at the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida. In addition to his clinical activities, Dr. Murthy is active in research and publishes in high impact journals. With that said, welcome Dr. Murthy and thank you for joining us today. Thank you and thank you for, for being on today. It's, it's, it's an unusual time. It's uh, so hope you everyone here is well and safe, you know, and this is to talk to today about bone marrow transplantation, which is an, which is an integral part in a lot of the diseases that we that are that we cover that we treat that are that are under the spectrum of AAMDS. So, you know, it's good for everybody to get at least an introduction on what exactly we do what we can do to help you. And so you're better informed when you, when you see somebody for a transplant consult or even after your transplant. Uh, next slide. So we're gonna talk about a couple of things. You know, we'll talk about why we do transplants, the transplant process itself from the pre-transplant, during your transplant, and then after the transplant and about long-term follow-up survivorship. And then at the end, we, we can take some questions. So just to start from discussing about the types of transplants, it's important to know that there are two types of trans stem cell transplants that we perform. One is an autologous transplant, which is essentially means your own or your own stem cells. These are transplants that are done particularly for diseases like multiple myeloma, lymphoma, and, so, and germ cell cancers like testicular cancers. This is a point, the purpose of an auto transplant is to provide high dose chemotherapy and use the stem cells to recover your counts faster. This is not really, there's not really an immune mediated component to this. It is a safer procedure it is a faster recovery. An allogeneic transplant is a donor stem cell transplant. This takes into account not just the chemotherapy aspect of it, but it takes into account the mismatch 
in the mismatching between the donor and the recipient in order to provide an immune mediated response that helps fight the disease. It, it does have more inherent risks, but it has more long-term benefit and curative benefit. And these are our go-tos, especially when we consider treatment of leukemias, MDS, uh, myeloproliferative neoplasms, aplastic anemia, as well as lymphomas that may have failed autologous transplant. There, like I said, there is a higher risk of mortality. There is something called graft versus host disease, which we'll talk about, but there is a higher, higher, there is a better chance of a cure because of this. Next slide, please. So this is kind of a timeline and I wanted to put this out here and this can, the, you know, we start by making sure is this the right treatment for you? And, and then are you fit enough to undergo a transplant? And then, and then, uh, then while this is happening, we're looking for your donor. And, you know, this, and then we assess the disease to make sure that you are ready to go. So those first four dots pretty much happen before you undergo a transplant. When you go into transplant, then you get your conditioning, your stem cells, you are, we are monitoring you, we're taking care of you, and we're waiting for you. Engraftment means that your counts have for cover, your white count, your hemoglobin, and your platelets. Once you, uh, once we get to uh, you discharge, then we keep you in the, in, within a close vicinity, and that's where we do the acute GVHD monitoring and treatment. And then finally, when we get past that, and that usually is about 100 days, then we start focusing on the long term, on survivorship, on monitoring for chronic GVHD, on your vaccinations, and your long-term health. Next, please. So again, we talked briefly, we need to know the reasons we do a, an allogeneic transplantation. So we do, we treat uh, most acute myeloid leukemias with very few exceptions. Most AMLs we do, we treat uh, with allogeneic stem cell transplantation. High risk MDS and high risk myeloproliferative neoplasm, particularly primary myelofibrosis are indications for transplant. Chronic myeloid leukemia used to be one of the most indicated for uh, for allogeneic transplant before the advent of tyrosine kinase inhibitors like imatinib and desatinib, we still reserve, we still treat them, but usually we treat them for people who cannot tolerate the medications or people who, who they are, their disease is refractory to medication. We also treat severe aplastic anemia with allo transplant. High risk CLL may be changing, but right now it is still an indication for transplant. And, and non Hodgkin and Hodgkin lymphoma in particular situations. Next, please. So, important things we know is with an allo transplant, who is a donor? So, a donor is typically either related or unrelated, and a related donor is a sibling, you know, first, uh, like a true, a full sibling, or a haploidentical donor, which can be a parent or a child, or a sibling that isn't a full match. In, if we cannot identify a related sibling, we have unrelated donors who donate their, who donate and participate in banks and stems and donor uh, programs, such as the National Marrow Donor Program. In addition, for, for people who don't have donors, there are uh, banks where we store umbilical cord blood, and that has the ability to be used as, uh, at, in an allogeneic transplant. And when we do talk about a transplant, we usually talk about how we get the stem cells. Either we, we, get, we, we retrieve the stem cells from a donor through bone marrow, and that would require a donor going into the operating room and having their stem cells harvested under general anesthesia. Or we would, we would collect it through peripheral blood, 
where we would give shots of a drug called nupigen to mobilize someone's stem cells into their blood. And then we would collect them kind of like we would collect blood if people were donating blood. And then umbilical cord blood is obviously collected and donated uh, from during uh, childbirth. Next, please. So this is kind of to, to show you, you know, a breakdown of how HLA is passed from what, from a parent to a child. And, you know, kind of to illustrate, looking at, so just to illustrate, a, a, ch a sibling, a person who is looking for an HLA match has a, a sibling is a 25% match chance of being a match, which is great odds. So we, but you know, there are a chance that they are, they are not. Uh, what this also shows you, and I just want you to look at the, if you look at the, uh, at the way the, the colors are, the reason I show you this is because before the advent of haploidentical transplant, if we didn't have a match related or unrelated, we had a lot of problems deciding whether to go with a transplant. With a haploidentical transplant now becoming a much more widely applicable in the world, we have a donor as long as you have, if you have a parent, if you have a child, or you have a sibling, even if they're not, even if you don't have a full match sibling donor, you have a potential donor. And that gives access to a cure to treatment like allogeneic transplant. Next, please. So I kind of want, you know, I've been talking about donors. I kind of wanted to put this into a, into a kind of a table just to show you, you know, these are the things that we as transplanters think about when we're choosing the right donor. You know, we look at a match sibling. Right now, that is the ideal donor. They are, they are readily available. They have right now the best outcomes of any donor in terms of in terms of toxicity, in terms of graft versus host disease. A match unrelated donor, the rates have gotten a lot better. So the outcomes are similar to a match sibling donor. However, there may be difficulties in finding a donor, especially minority donors who the, if we take a Caucasian uh, patient, they have about a 70% chance of locating a donor. A minority, a African-American or other minorities have about a 25 to 30% chance of finding an unrelated donor. That means two things. We need more people to don donate to the donor registry, particularly minorities. But this is also a consideration when we are looking at a patient and determining the, the, how fast we can get a donor. Haploidentical donors, they're much easier to identify because they're related. They're more readily available because, because of the relation. There is less graft versus host disease, but there, there may be higher risks of relapse. Cord blood, again, whenever you're dealing with an unrelated donor, they may not be readily available. Uh, there is much less GVHD in cord blood transplants. However, the problem with cord blood transplants is that we have a lot of infection issues and delayed, what's called delayed immune reconstitution. And I think also there are a few centers that are highly experienced in cord blood and a lot of other centers that may not have as much experience. So by and by, haploidentical transplantation has actually taken off compared to cord blood transplantation to the point where people are actually starting to consider haploidentical versus match sibling donor. So things, this slide continues to evolve. Next, please. So what do we do? When, we, when you come to see us for, to discuss a transplant, we start working you up. We start determining the first thing is, where is your disease at? So in certain diseases, a PET and MRI are, are going to be a, uh, necessary to determine where your disease is. More often than not, it's going to involve a bone marrow biopsy because we need to see what the disease is. Is it in remission? What is the level of remission? Do we have uh, certain factors that 
influence our decision, high risk features, minimal residual disease. One thing that is not mentioned on here, and it's for particular diseases, but not all, a lumbar puncture. Some diseases do have, are either are involved in the CNS or have a risk of involving in the CNS. We want, we need to make sure these things, we want to know where we are before embarking into a transplant. The second part is you. We want to know how healthy you are, irrespective of the disease. We want to know what kind of shape you're in, because in, in, a, in a colloquial way, we want to know, can you take a punch and get up? And I think that's really what I tell my patients. If you take a hit, can you withstand it and get up and recover and go through with the transplant? So aspects that help us with this include your performance status. A simple question is how, how physically active you are, how much time you spend out of bed. That's what we use to, as a performance status indicator. Your medical history and your, and your medical conditions that you have, such as diabetes, hypertension, if you had prior cancers, heart conditions, et cetera. We look at your cardiac function with a, with a 2D echo and an EKG, pulmonary function, but pulmonary function tests. We look at your liver function tests. We also look at your infection markers. Next, please. So when, as, we, as we mentioned, we take all of these things, all your medical history, all these things, and we compile this into a score. Some of you may have heard this score. It's called the HCTCI. And we take about 17 specific variables and they have a score. And really that score tell, gives us a risk of what we call non-relapse mortality. What that means is, are, what is your risk of dying from something other than your disease directly related to the transplant? That means infection, reference host disease, organ toxicity, and what we see is people with less comorbid conditions, people with a lower score, and this score is not just about medical history. It also incorporates those other things I mentioned, like your heart function, your pulmonary function tests, infections, and as well as your medical history. And we know the higher your score, the higher the risk of you suffering or potentially dying from your transplant. And this is, an influ this is an influential factor because what we don't want to do is put you through unnecessary suffering. We want to provide a curative option and give you the best chance at a cure, but we want to make sure that we are giving you the best chance and not putting you through something that may not help, but may hurt. Prob the biggest issue with a transplant is once you start, you can't go back. That's why we spend so much time in the beginning making sure that you're ready for this. Next, please. So just to put all of this together, what do we consider for a transplant? We look at your disease. We look at, your, we look at the sensitivity. We look at the state of the disease. We, look, we then look at your, we look at your donor. We, we assess your risk of graft versus host disease. We look at you. We look at all your functional status. We look at, the, we look at your don whether we can get a donor. We look at psychosocial assessment is important. You know, in a way, we're putting you through quite a lot. You're going to, patients are in, hospitalized for upwards of three to four weeks during an allo transplant. We know, and that's not even taking into account all the things that you've had to go through with your disease. We want to make sure that we are identifying every possible way to help you and care for you. So this is an important part. Caregiver availability is a big deal because when we keep you close, we keep you after the hospitalization, we keep you for about 100 days. It, uh, we keep you close by. You need somebody with you. It doesn't have to be the same person, but every day, you need somebody with you. Yeah, maybe times you're too weak. Yeah, maybe times you need someone to get you food, someone to pick up medication. You have to have some help. And we identify that, a plan for that 
before you start your transplant. And then we take all of that and then we come up with, we mixed it all together and we concoct the plan. And from this, we determine who's the best donor, what is the best regimen to give you for your transplant, what is the best prevention strategy for your graft resource disease. And then we, ha- we make ourselves a transplant. Next, please. So again, the formula for a transplant. What is your disease? What kind of donor? What is the best donor? Because different donors and have different effects, different risks, different benefits on the disease, on the toxicities. We look at what kind of stem cells we think are better. We look at the intensity of the chemotherapy we give. And then we look at the GVHD prevention. That is what we all have to determine. And that is the formula for your transplant. Next, please. The reason and conditioning intensity, just to go into the reason we look at this is because it does have, you know, it's a seesaw. I think that's the best way to put this. There are risks to doing one way or the other. The more intense we give you, the more anti disease activity you may have, but the higher risk of graft versus host disease and regimen toxicity that you may have. So we try to lower the intensity. That may, be, that may be less toxic, maybe easier to handle, but that gives you the higher risk of relapse. So we have to constantly weigh each things out and kind of go with a balancing act. And that seesaw, you know, we, can't, we don't want to do too much one way or the other. The goal is to try to strike that perfect balance that we can give you the most optimal results while minimizing your toxicities the best we can. Next, please. So hospitalization typically starts with chemotherapy for about five, six days. This is your, what's called the conditioning. Stem cell infusion, we call day zero. And then based on the type of transplant, we then start the immune, immune suppressing medicines to prevent graft host disease and to prevent rejection of the donor stem cells. That could be anywhere from day minus one to day plus one to day plus five. Depending on the transplant and the intensity, we typically say, give, say from the infusion, at 15 to 25 days following the transplant is when we expect your counts to engraft, meaning that your neutrophil count goes over 500, and then we feel like it is safe to bring you outside and to start watching you closely in the clinic setting. Next, please. So why do we keep, why do, you know, we, I mentioned we keep you 100 days near the transplant center. Why? Because this is the highest, this is actually the highest risk of a transplant. It's that first 100 days. And we have seen and we've done studies where if we sent people home and it could be far away, depending on how far you are from your transplant center, the further you went from a transplant center, the higher the risk you had of dying. So we, we arrange for housing and we keep people close by so we can monitor them. We need to monitor not whether you need transfusions. We need to make adjustments to your immunosuppression level and check your drug levels. Sometimes you may need antibiotics, which may not be just a single day, but maybe intravenous and maybe over a couple of days and we keep monitoring you for graft versus host disease and infection. If everything works out well, typically by day 100, we are sending you home. Next slide. So this is our, this is our Gabriel house. This is where we keep our patients and our caregivers during their, during their transplantation. It's, it's a nice building. Uh, there are some, uh, I think there are still some things in flux because of, because of COVID, but we can go into that later. I know there are some uh, issues about that, but at least right now at Mayo, we are securing housing for anybody who needs to go for a transplant because even regardless, your disease is not waiting for anything. And we know that, and we are moving forward 
to get the care that you need. And that's pretty much the way that all major transplant centers are. Next, please. So let's talk about graft versus host disease. So what, you know, what I say about graft versus host disease is, is kind of like this. This is a pen. This is a foreign object. If I put a foreign object in your body, your body is going to attack it because it doesn't belong. That is called host versus graft. Now let's flip this around. Now pretend this is an immune system and I'm putting an immune system in you and your immune system may recognize your body as foreign. Its natural tendency is to attack it. And that is graft versus host disease. It is mediated by your white cells and your T cells, which are, medi which are, which are a result of your donor stem cell graft and they may start looking at your organs as foreign. So this is why we have to suppress the immune system for a while and then gradually allow it to engraft, allow, give it time for it to recognize the body and make sure that it doesn't do anything severe and dangerous. So there are two types of graft versus host disease. For, for just simplicity's sake, we kind of say that acute graft versus host disease is up to day 100. And chronic is anything after that. Next, please. So there are different organ systems that are involved in both in acute graft, versus host, acute graft versus host disease. It is pretty much limited to skin, G, uh, GI tract, and liver. Those are really the main uh, organs that are involved with acute graft versus host disease. And again, this lasts about 100. We worry about this for about 100 days. Now, after 100 days, you can develop chronic graft versus host disease. And that's the, the green panel. There are a lot of different organs that can be involved. There is a wide array of severity. Some people, it is very mild and doesn't even require treatment. It just requires some monitoring. Some skin can be treated topically. But there are some who may have severe graft versus host disease. The first step for prevention of graft versus host disease is planning your transplant. How, however, even the best laid plans, we are, not a, we are good at predicting, but we are not 100%. So that is why some, we have to prepare that sometimes these things can happen. But I, what I can say is, Compared to where we were even five, 10 years ago, we are a lot better, not just at treatment, but at prevention. Next, please. So after 100 days, you're sprung. You could go home. And, you know, I've had people that are like, they, they look like they've just broken out of jail. And it's a happy day for me, too, because it, it's, it's a milestone. So we get them out. We get them home, back to home cooking. And what, we, what, what is important in this time is the following. If, there, if there's no signs of active GVHD, it's time to start slowly taking the medicine off. We don't want to immediately take it off. We slowly taper it so that we don't get any flares of graft versus host disease. We make sure that the disease is still in remission, that the transplant has done essentially what it's supposed to do and treat the disease. Sorry. The glare is, there we go. Uh, we, we also, you know, at certain diseases, we start, we also will talk about maintenance therapy following the transplant or post-transplant therapy. We also will talk about vaccinations because all of, as a result of a transplant, people lose their natural humoral immunity. So you may need, you probably will need to get revaccinated for popular things like tetanus, polio, hepatitis, and so on, and measles, mumps, rubella. Finally, we also talk about survivorship because you've just gone through all this. We want to ensure that your care, that your health lasts 
into beyond just these 100 days. Next slide, please. So just because a transplant, you know, we've done the transplant, doesn't mean the only things to worry about are graft host disease. There are, thing, there are things that people are at risk for. There are things that we have to be very, very cognizant about, not just as a transplant survivor, but as a cancer survivor in general. So these are late, late effects you know, that to go over. Anytime you have cancer, anytime you've been exposed to chemotherapy, you are at risk for secondary cancer or secondary malignancy. So that involves, so we, we recommend things such as uh, mammograms, colonoscopies, pap smears, things to make sure that you're not at risk for cancer screening. There are, there are issues that people have with sexual dysfunction, infertility, with endocrine disorders. Cardiovascular health is a very big uh, concern in the survivorship area. So not only are we assessing these with risk, with tests and screening, we are encouraging people that once you're in this survivorship period, it's time to focus on your diet and your exercise to take care of yourself. There are risks of osteoporosis, so we do recommend DEXA scans, particularly for people who've been on steroids for a long time. And psychological, it is real. There are issues that people have because of their transplant, because of their cancer, depression, anxiety, fatigue, financial concerns is a big thing. So, you know, these are things that we as transplanters are wary of, are cognizant of, and this is why we've actually taken large steps of developing survivorship clinics within our bone marrow transplant program to take care of you because our care for you does not stop at day 100. Our care for you goes on forever. Next, please. So this I kind of put there because your quality of life is paramount, but it takes, it takes understanding, treating, screening and being cognizant of all these things to ensure that we improve and maintain your quality of life. That is why we do a transplant it's to help you survive, but to also for you to survive with quality of life. Next, please. Because you can survive a long time after a transplant. And these numbers bear that out. If you can make it, you can make it for a long time. Next slide. So it's not just people, it's not just a physician, it's not just someone like me. There are a lot of people. You have a huge team looking out for you. When, when, you're, when you get a transplant, you know, from the beginning to the post-transplant survivorship, you have a lot of people looking out for you. And, you know, I can't do this alone. I need a lot of help. And I am fortunate to have a wonderful team. And that team will always be looking after you. Next slide. That, thank you all. I apologize for the glare that came up. Thank you so much, Dr. Murthy. We have a few questions. Is there a minimum or maximum age to be considered uh, a donor? It's a good question, and it comes up a lot. It does come up a lot. Uh, we don't. I don't like giving maximum ages. You know, we 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 age is a number, and but it is an important number because there are survival numbers that survival does decrease as the age of a transfer recipient goes up. But I have seen old, older people who have been in excellent shape go through a transplant. And I have seen younger people who have not been in good shape who don't, who don't tolerate a transplant. I focus more on the, on the history, the performance status, the medical comorbidities, that's more important uh, in terms of determining an age. Uh, and this is especially 
with the advent of reduced intensity transplants that we are able to treat older people. So we don't have a set age uh, when we determine who is eligible for a transplant or not. Thank you. Is there a way for a transplant team to determine which patients would be at higher risk for GVHD? And uh, you did give a description of acute graphic versus host disease versus, versus chronic. Could you just maybe repeat a little bit about that? Uh, the, the first question is about, assi about assigning how we determine risk for graft versus host disease. Yes. So the risk for graft versus host disease comes from, from a couple of things. You know, we, it's, it's really assigned to the intensity of the chemotherapy. That is the biggest risk. And the second risk comes from the type of donor that we select. You know, match the, the higher intensity chemo is dubs with a higher risk of graft versus host disease. The more mismatched a donor is, a matched sibling is the ideal donor because it has the least risk of graft versus host disease. Haploidenticals have much less risk of graft versus host disease compared to a mismatched donor or an un unrelated mismatched donor. So, but to think about it, the where it comes back to is the risks that we can take with the conditioning with the donor also plays into account how functional, how fit the patient is. It, that allows us to take the risk because it is a seesaw. The higher risk of graft versus disease comes with how strong we feel in treating and going after the disease. And that's with that conditioning intensity. If we don't think somebody can handle that conditioning intensity, they're going to get less risk of GVHD, but they're going to get less risk of relapse. Those are the things we have to balance out. Uh, in, terms of, in terms of differences between chronic graft versus disease, was that the next question? Yes. So the difference between chronic, acute and chronic graft versus disease, there are two in particular. One, acute is about the, the first difference is the timing. Typically, acute graft versus acute graft versus disease occurs between day 30 and day 100. Chronic graft versus disease can occur any time, typically after day 100. The second uh, difference is, is the organs that are involved. Acute graft versus disease only really involves three organs, the liver, the gastrointestinal tract, and skin. Chronic graft versus disease can affect almost every organ. It can affect your eyes, it can affect your skin, lungs, joints, uh, muscle, it can cause low platelets, it can cause effusion, pleural effusions. It can do a lot more, uh, it can involve a lot more organs. That's kind of how we, we can tell acute from graft versus host disease is the organ involvement and typically the timing of, the, of when it comes on. Thank you. Is it ever possible to develop AML down the road? This question comes from a post-allogeneic stem cell transplant patient um, who had MDS and is post-transplant 10 years. So that is an excellent question. Uh, yes, it is. It is possible for, you know, I think that's a very, in that, that particular case, it's very interesting because in general, Let's put, let's first say is in general, there is a risk of developing a secondary cancer from a transplant. Any exposure to chemotherapy and from, an, from, an, from a stem cell transplant, autologous or allogeneic, you do have a risk of developing a secondary cancer. Most of the times, the cancers are more solid tumor and can be things that are not that big a deal, like basal cells or squamous cell carcinomas. In some instances, though, you can develop a secondary hematological malignancy, such as MDS, such as AML, such as ALL, it can happen. In, in, your, in, your, question, in your question, you may have a risk 
of developing AML, not just as a secondary AML, but if your, if your MDS relapses and it turns out to be AML, that is a possibility. I think what you have going for you is 10 years. And, the, and you know, I go back to that one slide about the long-term survival. People who make it that long, they usually do well and they usually don't, don't, it, it suffer, they don't have relapses. Things are possible, but I think the 10 years right now is what is really working in your favor. Now, would a second transplant be recommended in this situation? I, that, you know, yeah, I would say if it's a blank slate, yes. What I think, but what that is, is everything that went into planning the first transplant has to be done again to make sure that they're a candidate for the second transplant. That means the same workup, making sure the disease is under control, making sure that they're fit and functional and able to get through a transplant. Those things are, those we would be essential. The transplant, a second transplant is possible. We do do second transplants, but again, we would have to basically treat it like the first transplant and make sure that you are eligible and capable of receiving one. Thank you. This question comes from a MDS patient who was diagnosed in 2013, had a stem cell transplant in September of um, 2014. Mm -hmm. Her father and one brother also had MDS. What do we know about passing on of MDS? Uh, there are familial syndromes. I think that's a very, I mean, I think that's something that I would be checking. I mean, it's, so here's the thing, you know, first off, it's important to know what ages the MDS were developed because that I think helps determine like, you know, if everybody's developing MDS in their 70s and 80s, I, you know, you're not, you're, you're more likely to ascribe this to old age and, and sporadic mutations as developing MDS. However, with that kind of a family history, I do think it warrants some genetic counseling and to see if there is an underlying familial syndrome that may be leading to MDS. Uh, you know, without knowing more information, it is kind of, it would be suspicious that a patient, a sibling, and their father all have MDS. That would be a, that is something that would be, that I think warrants further testing, just without knowing more information. Thank you. Can half siblings be a donor? Uh, potentially. It, it, as long, so... When you when you look get, or when you get a donor, you you when you are, if you have a a mother and a father, a mother passes on one HLA gene and a father passes on one HLA gene to a child. So you will always have you will always have your mother's and your father's. So your mother and your father are always passing on an HLA gene. So your direct will always be a full match. Your half sibling, your, your siblings, I mean, your, your parents, your siblings will always be half match. As long as your half sibling, as long as you share a parent, you should be a half match and able to get a haploidentical transplant. And even then, we will confirm it and we will make sure that, it, that you are a half match and able to be a haploidentical donor. Thank you. This comes from a, a patient, a PNH patient who had a blood clot that resulted in a heart attack. Can this patient still be considered for a bone marrow transplant? So, uh, potentially, yes. Uh, I think it matters on the current heart function as well as the rest of the 
comorbidity and workup, I think all of that together gives you the risk. You know, if, if there is a significant risk, it, then it may influence ways that we would be able to take to a transplant, but have to adjust certain situations. Like maybe we would have to do a reduced intensity if there is more, uh, if there's less, uh, less than optimal performance status or comorbidities or a higher uh, comorbid score. Those are, those are things that, co- that we will look at and put everything together. I wouldn't just say just because you had a heart attack that that knocks you out for a transplant, but it, is, it does add an element of risk. And you know, with risk, transplanters have to adjust their plan when they see these risks and we are, and you sh- and your transplanter should be talking you through every single aspect of this, how we make our plan. You should be aware of everything that comes into how we make your plan. Thank you. If you have low level conditioning, do you still have some vaccination resistance? Yeah, you still can lose your you still can lose your vaccination titers, uh, yes. And, you know, we just at, are at a point with, in terms of infection guidelines by our parent organization, the, the ASTCT, that we have guidelines that we just administer. It, it is just easier for us to re-administer the vaccines rather than continually to look at titers and to keep check and to check them. Because, the ty- the, you may lose your titers later on. So we want to make sure that you are getting your, your full uh, humoral immunity back. So, but the, to answer the question, yes, you, you still, even with a reduced intensity transplant, it's still higher doses of chemotherapy than most of you would receive in even a leukemia induction. It's just called reduced intensity compared to the full blast chemo that is in a myeloablative transplant. It's still strong. Thank you. At what point should patients expect to start the revaccination process after a transplant? So after, after an allogeneic transplant, uh, typically certain vac- so different programs have different uh, protocols in place. You know, typically for us, we 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 will we would start some vaccinations influenza and pneumococcal around the three to six month mark. Other vaccinations usually we're going to start once we have at least tapered off the immunosuppression. Thank you. Is the bone marrow transplant process different for um, each disease, specifically aplastic anemia patients versus MDS patients? Uh, it's different in some regards, more or less to do with, you know, certain, I guess, certain drugs that are involved uh, in the conditioning uh, and, and maybe uh, there are two big differences, I would say, for an aplastic anemia patient compared to an MDS, typically. One, in aplastic anemia, we typically do not use peripheral blood for a transplant. We typically use bone marrow because the, the complications from peripheral blood is, has been, is a lot in aplastic anemia patients. So that's one big difference. The second difference is we use more of uh, antithymocyte globulin in the conditioning for aplastic anemia patients, because this is a primarily immune mediated disease rather than MDS, which, which high risk MDS essentially is what we consider a pre leukemia. So those are really the subtle differences, but once the transplant starts, the, the way we look at them post transplant, there is no real difference. We, at that point, they are both, they are both post allogeneic transplant patients, and we look at them exact, pretty much the same way from a transplant standpoint. 
Thank you. This question comes from a PNH patient who is currently taking prednisone. They also have osteoporosis. Can a bone marrow transplant still be considered and would the osteoporosis go away? Uh, a bone marrow transplant can be considered, yes. Uh, I, I don't think the, the osteoporosis is not something that would preclude a transplant depending on the level of it. Uh, will it go away? No. There's actually a risk that it could get worse long term. It's just something that we have to be wary of in the survivorship period. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. The, especially, you know, because of the, and the other thing is that when you go for the transplant, we would likely need to stop the steroids because the steroids can interfere with the GVHD prevention. So those are, I think, the factors that would be going into a, a planned transplant such as this. Thank you. Um, as far as getting back to some normal activities for transplant patients, is there a point that is usually suggested that patients could start to begin um, some type of physical activity? Yeah, I, I would say, you know, I say for the first three months, you're really tired. And I don't really push people at that point. What my, I do want you to be physically active, but my threshold is more or less, I want you to be walking, walking a mile, a couple of miles a day. You know, that's kind of, in terms of getting back to normal activities, I say you got to give it about six to nine months to really get back in the swing of things. And you shouldn't feel too bad if it's taking that long. You know, you've gone through a lot with a transplant. So I think that, you know, a key point for me is also getting somebody off of the immunosuppression. Then that alleviates a lot of the infection risks that come with it. And then that also allows me to say, okay, you know what, go out, go push. You can push it. It's fine if you can handle it. Uh, so I would say more or less the first three months, take things slow, take things easy. But I, my hope is by about six, eight months, even nine months, yeah, we can start pushing things a little. It's why I usually recommend people, you know, even beforehand, before they transplant, that they put in for leave for about nine to 12 months. So they give themselves that time to recover. I know it's hard to say that. And I've had people that like give me double takes on this, but it's kind of a, at this point, I consider this an investment, a long-term investment in your life. You have to put, put this in, in the bank so that we could try our best to ensure you a long life with quality. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Murthy, for your time and your expertise in joining us today.